on. Testing, testing, one, two, three. Hi, um, can you guys hear me okay? Okay, my name is Ballard and I'm an engineer with Cisco. Uh, my background is in development. Hi, I used to work with Ken over at uh, IBM and I started out as a developer writing systems automation tools. And uh, I've been here at Cisco now for about four years. And so I'm gonna talk about how I develop applications on top of, uh, on top of OpenStack. And um, I've, previous to this, I had a startup as well, so I've been uh, doing a lot of that, and I'm pretty familiar with some of the tools. Um, I'm actually really surprised. I, I had hoped that there would be a lot more attending that last session. I thought it was absolutely fantastic. And I think the next couple of sessions after lunch, after this presentation, are going to be amazing. So I hope that this gets a lot f more filled up. So um, I'm going to tell you about my startup that I'm creating right now. We specialize, we are, we are the leading provider of lawn gnomes as a service. And what we do is under the cover of darkness is our people will come in and they'll put lawn gnomes on somebody's lawn and they'll wake up in the morning and that will be their birthday card. That's our website that we're developing and I'm going to walk you through our architecture today of how we did this on Cisco OpenStack uh, private cloud. And I'm also going to be showing you this in demo and live uh, as well. So if you go to the actual site, uh, lawngnomes.com, you'll see that the site is, oh, you can't see anything there. Let me, let me mirror my display. I don't know how to, well, try going to lawngnome.com and see if that does it for you. I'll, I'll figure out my mirrorings problem later. Okay, so what I have a couple requirements for my environment. Number one is I gotta keep as much of it in-house as possible because even though I'm a startup, I'm actually a startup within a larger organization. I'm gonna start up within a business entity and they already have a lot of infrastructure and in fact, they already have OpenStack Private Cloud. My other requirement is I wanna build for portability. I wanna make sure that if we decide that we don't like Cisco OpenStack Private Cloud that we can move away from it or go somewhere else. Uh, maybe to another OpenStack distribution, maybe to DigitalOcean, maybe AWS, maybe Azure, something like that. So we want to build for portability. We also want to automate all the things, and we want to use containers because that's what all the cool kids are doing right now. So we're going we're gonna to try to follow that. So what does our stack take? To quote Steven Tyler, what does it take? Um, we're going to use Cisco OpenStack Private Cloud, which used to be formerly known as MetaCloud. That was an acquisition we made in November. We're going to be using CoreOS as our operating system. We're going to be using Docker at, for the container management, GitLab, Jenkins, Slack, and Ansible. And I'm going to be covering all these in more detail. So this presentation that I'm going to give is actually going to be very in the weeds of how we can figure these things up. And you'll notice there's probably some components missing on this stack. For example, how do we manage containers that are constantly going up and down with something like Kubernetes or Mesos? We don't have that in this stack. That's something our engineers are working on in lawngnomed.com. So here's just a, a brief look at what our stack looks like. The blue circles, those are instances when we, if you come from a VMware background and you're just calling VMs, instances is just a way that we say things in the cloud, but it can mean the same thing. It just means that those are VMs that are temporary and we don't, they might not necessarily be there tomorrow. And so all of the blue dots are instances or virtual machines that are running in our cloud. The red dots or the red circles, those are containers that are running. And so everything is going to be running in containers and the green dots, or the green circles, those are the volumes that are mounted. So each of our VMs, the, well, at least in this case, only two of them are mounting a volume, and that's where the data persists. So if the instance goes away, the data still lives on in that volume. So that's just our architecture. We have two load balancers where they come in. I only have three web servers on this right now. And then those are going to back end load balancers that go to a database that's replicating back and forth. I'm gonna mostly be talking about the first part of it, 
and ignore the database for now. Inside of OpenStack, you have this concept of availability zones. In MetaCloud, we have the idea that availability zones map to what you may know in AWS as regions. And so just because something exists in one availability zone doesn't mean that it's going to exist in another availability zone. So for example, if I have a user that is OK to log into availability AZ1, that doesn't mean he can log into AZ2, because he might not have credentials. And so likewise, projects may exist in one availability zone and not in the other one. So one of the ways we architect a design is we might say, OK, let's put half of the application inside availability zone 1 and the other half in availability zone 2. And what that gives us the ability to do is maybe update code on one availability zone and not update the code in the other availability zone. And that way I can do A-B testing and I can run analytics and I can see, OK, which one did people click on more? And then your, your load balancers, I only drew one up here, but there might be a couple load balancers in each availability zone. With the architecture of Cisco OpenStack Private Cloud, the, um, uh, well, let's go, let's go to the next section. So the other idea is you have this concept of projects. And projects are what different teams would use. So I might have one team that's working on the API layer. I might have another team that's working on the web layer another team that's working on the, the, a mobile layer. And all of those teams can move in tandem. And as Adrian was saying, it's an API-driven world. And they're all consuming and talking to each other through APIs. What about auto-scaling? Auto-scaling is the idea that things will go up and down like an elevator. OK. So we don't have native auto-scaling on Cisco OpenStack Private Cloud today. What we do have, and, and so you can do that in regular OpenStack now if you use something like Heat and Solometer. Right now, Heat uh, is now inside of Cisco OpenStack Private Cloud, but Solometer is not. And we had reasons for that. There were scaling problems that they had. So those are, so, but there's a number of ways you can solve that. And so I've mentioned a couple of them up here. You can build it yourself, something that's maybe event driven. You can use scripts to monitor it to create these. But in all these cases, you're probably going to have an agent that's sitting on the instance and watching to see if it's taking up time, or to see if those CPU utilization goes up or the memory goes up. And then it will respond to that. So if it's very idle, it might take down some instances. Uh, if it gets a lot of traffic after the Super Bowl, we might add more. The other thing we have that we can take advantage of when we're designing this application are anti-affinity rules. This is something that we just came out in a, a new release. And this allows us to make sure that if we have Web Server 1 and 2 and N, we make sure that they are not scheduled on the same hypervisors, thus making it so our application can have more reliability. The last thing I'll say before we get into the, very, into the weeds is the analytics and the logging. I'm not going to really go into it right here, but one of the things you can do inside of OpenStack Private Cloud is create an aggregate that has which, which is a section of hypervisors that is just used for analytics. And so you might use just that for doing things like Hadoop or, or Spark or whatever it is that you're running to analyze the results of all those logs that are coming in. So that might be a separate product. And uh, that's something I hope to talk about maybe at a, at, a, at a future event. So let me show you what my development pipeline looks like or my application delivery pipeline looks like. What we have is we have a developer who is first going to write some code. And they do a commit, and that commit gets put to GitLab. GitLab is a lot like GitHub, but it's an open source version that I can download and run inside of my own data center. Um, one of the requirements was that I wanted to keep everything as, as much as I could in-house. So everything that I, show, I am showing up here is in-house with the exception of Slack, which I'll talk about in a second. So the developer is going to push code to GitLab. GitLab is my source code repository. This is where all my stuff lives. GitLab has what's called a webhook into Jenkins, which is another service that's running. And Jenkins will monitor for changes. And when that change happens, they say, oh my gosh, somebody just pushed some code. I'm going to do something. So what he does is he's going to spin up some instances inside of Cisco OpenStack Private Cloud to run the container, or to, to create, he's going to create a new instance that new instance is going to create a new container from the code that was just checked in. 
and then it's going to run the test cases on that. Once those test cases are done, if they pass, it's going to go to the local registry, which is step five. So the artifact, or what comes out of the process of building this test cycle, which is all automated, is a new container that can be put into production, or a release candidate, as, as Adrian was saying in the last uh, presentation. Steps one through five, that is continuous integration. That is from code to something that can be placed in ops. Continuous delivery is putting step six into place. And that's where what we do is we, register, is we pull automatically from that registry and put it into production. One of the things when we stand up all of this environment is we want to do everything automatic, automatically. So I used Ansible to push everything up, but I didn't use it after that. All I used it was to get my base infrastructure up. And then I could take those same scripts that I used and I could put it to a different cloud and bring everything up, or a different project and bring everything up. And finally, the last piece that I think is extremely important is the communication with uh, the rest of your team. You want everybody to know if somebody made a push or if somebody's code didn't, if somebody broke the build. When I was working for IBM about 10 years ago, what I would do is I would write code all through the week and then on Fridays we would have to push those code changes in. The build team would kick off the build during the weekend and then on Monday you'd come back and you would have the code and you'd be able to say, okay, let's develop from there. And the testers would get the code and test that week. What would happen is that I might break the build. I actually did break the build a couple of times. And the build uh, would get pushed out about three more days. But while that was happening, I was still writing code. And so the developer, so then the testing team would get it. And so everything was always synchronous. And when they would say, hey, Valerie, we have this problem, I go, oh, I already fixed that. I'd test the new code. We're like, we don't have the new code. We have to wait. So doing it this way, where everybody knows what's happening and everything's instant, gives us speed and makes our, um, make, makes our processes more relevant. OK, so that's enough of the overview. Let's talk about actually building it up and bring it up. So first, I want to tell you about how I did my development server, or my develop, and it's pretty simple. All it is is it's one VM, one, in, or one instance that's running in the cloud. This instance right here mounts a volume. Uh, and this is elastic. This is, if, if AWS speak, this is an elastic block storage. In, uh, in OpenStack, this is a Cinder block. I'm just mounting something from Cinder, or in this case, Ceph, is, is serving as that. And what that does is once it comes up, and again, I'm bringing everything up here with Ansible. Once that comes up, I'm going to bring some containers up. So I need to make sure that the containers come up right away. And so there's actually um, six different containers that are running on this one instance. And when you think about, if any of you guys have done system administration before, which I'm willing to bet a few of you in this room have, then you know that trying to get a lot of these services to work on a single a virtual machine or a single machine is very difficult. Well, containers make it very easy because it doesn't matter what the dependencies are of Nginx or the dependencies are of GitLab. You have containers that can all come up on the same environment. And so everything comes up in the same environment and they all save state to one place, that volume. And I could make a multiple one. I could take snapshots of it if I wanted to daily. But it's all just running on a core OS and it's very simple. So the first thing you have to do in order to bring something like this up is you have to get your credentials from OpenStack to bring it up. So on the, the page here, it shows you how uh, you, you go to accessing security right there, and right away it shows you where your APIs are. The easiest thing to do is download the OpenStack RC file. Once I download that, I put it in my bash shell. I actually put it in my uh, dot bash uh, underscore profile. And that way, it's always there on my shell, and I can always get to it. That way, I don't have to store my passwords online. That's a firing offense. So you should never do that unless something's very encrypted. So once you have that, you should make sure your credentials work. And so I run a simple command like Nova list just to see all my instances. And if you don't have any instances up, you're not going to see anything, but at least the command won't error out on you. OK, the other thing I did before really kicking this off is I made my own security groups. I could have done this inside of Heat. I could have used a whole bunch of different processes. But I wanted to make sure that my ports were open so that I could run my dev stack. 
So the ports that I use in this case were port 5000 for the registry, 8080 for the Jenkins, and then these last two I use for GitLab. One so that I could SSH to it for check-ins and one that I could do HTTP on. And again, the only state in this system is a, is a, is a volume that I mounted. So in this case, it was uh, my, my development uh, virtual machine that I made is called CI, and it's mounting this volume called uh, dev VDB. I had to go up through it, I had to partition it, F-disk it, and make sure that it worked, and then once it did, it was up, so it was good. Okay, so I bring up my development instance, or my development instance, and I need to make sure all the containers run on it. And all of this code I'll put on uh, GitHub for you, so you can see it's just GitHub slash Ballard, uh, github.com slash Ballard, and it'll be like Cisco Live or something like that. Right now everything's stored in my local repository. But, um, so inside of my, using Ansible, I need to bring up a couple of these different uh, services or different containers. The first one is Nginx. And the reason I bring up Nginx is because I want people to be able to hit it without having to type ports. So I wanted you to be able to hit jenkins.lawngnomed.com. And if you do that, it'll take you directly to it because it goes through Nginx. He says, oh, hi, Jenkins is actually running port 8080. I'll pass it through to that point. Same with GitLab. I, you can do a gitlab.lawngnomed.com, and now everybody can get to it. And the same with the registry. I turned that off because that one's not secure. So just a pro tip, everything I've told you in the stack right now can be interchanged. Like, like Steven Tyler would want to say, you got to experiment. So um, there's a whole bunch of great tools out there. Um, Mitchell from HashiCorp was just up here talking about some of his. Any of those could be used in something like this as well. Okay, so let me show you a playbook of how I'm deploying my development server. It's actually pretty standard, um, and this is actually the entire thing, with the exception of the containers. But this is how we bring up just an instance on OpenStack Private Cloud with Ansible. So first of all, we're telling it just to connect to local, line two and three. We just connect to the local host, because we're not going out to the cloud yet. And we just tell it to ensure that a CI environment is deployed. It's declarative. So if it's already up, it's not going to put it back up. But if it's not up, it's going to put it up. And it's going to get all my passwords from environment variables. So you can see there, this is code that's safe to check in and is safe to show you guys, because it doesn't have any of my credentials inside of it. And then I give it the image name. I give it a key pair that I already created. The key pair is so that I can SSH into it without having to put my password in, because people are notorious for putting easy to break passwords on instances. So this key pair idea is, is genius. And um, then I give it the flavor ID. And I just have to look inside of OpenStack Private Cloud to say which one is the M1 large or something like that. And with this, you can actually tailor the flavors to the size that you want. So if you have something that requires a ton of RAM but very little CPU, you can make that uh, flavor inside of it. So you have a lot of choices for that. You just need to put the ID inside of that. The other thing I did is like giving a floating IP address. And then I'm giving it user data afterwards. So this is a script that you'll have to look at to see what does it do once the thing boots up. So when the instance says it's booting up to be used, what are some last minute scripts that I can do into it to make it work? So one of the scripts that I might put inside of this cloud config, which is line 24, is something that would make it so that I can access insecure registries. Because one of the things that you learn pretty quickly with Docker is that if you try to do a Docker pull to a private registry, if it's not secure, meaning that it doesn't have an SSL and it doesn't go through passwords, then it won't allow that. And so you have to actually create a flag in here that says, okay, this is internal, I'm fine, I'm gonna make it insecure. And so you tell it that as part of the cloud config. So when it boots up, it automatically can start using insecure registries. Joe Perry, pro tip. One of the things I see is people putting a ton of SSH commands. Like doing this all the time can get really tedious. This top line right here where it says SSH dash I and, and the rest of it, it's a lot of work to actually SSH into an instance. Instead, what you do is you put those credentials inside of a dot SSH slash config, 
and then from there, all you have to do is do the bottom line here, this SSH LG dev or whatever you named it in the host ID right here. And then it's very easy to constantly SSH back in, into it if you need to. This is helpful when you're first spinning this up. After it's up, you don't really need to do much at all, right? Okay, so that, we talked about how I spun up the development environment. We have that all good. I didn't show you the Ansible scripts that deploy the containers because they're all really just one-liners, maybe two-liners. You just give it the container name. The difficult one is probably the Jenkins one, but I'll have that up on source code so you can look at it afterwards on GitHub uh, because there's dependencies there with linking. Like, like uh, it needs Redis and it also needed um, a Postgres database. So okay, so here's, here's where we're gonna talk about the, the, the web and load balancers. So we created the stuff on the left. Now let's create the thing on the right. And this is fairly easy because it's a lot of work that we've already done. We're just gonna use OpenStack and Ansible in this case to bring up one task right here, which is to uh, bring up an instance. And you see this looks a lot like the other one where I'm just applying passwords and, and I just, I'm just telling it what image ID I want, the flavor type, um, what I want the names to be, and giving it some IP addresses. That's pretty much it, and you can use something like that to bring up a whole bunch of different ones. So that helps me bring up the load balancer. So I do that, and two load balancers are up. Now the web servers look a lot, look, look very similar. The difference here in this configuration is that I'm not putting floating IP addresses on the web servers, because the web servers are behind those load balancers. So we only have a, we have a, a fixed amount of floating IP addresses that they've given us, so we can't exhaust all of those. So what we do is we put all those web servers behind the load balancers on private IP addresses. So that's the code of, of how we do that. One of the things that you see inside of uh, this, though, is there's another cloud config file after it, so some things I want to have happen when it boots up. And so what I wanted it to do is I wanted it to install Python. So that, again, it's probably hard to see right now. But I'm installing Python as part of a post script when it boots up. And I'm also doing that, allowing it to access insecure registries. So there's two different ways you can do it. I'm showing the other way right here. But this will install Python on top of all my instances that boot up. And the reason I wanted that is because I need to run Ansible, and Ansible requires Python on there. OK, so now, after I've got the web environment stood up, I've got the development environment set up. Now I need to configure Jenkins. I need to configure that automation. Going back to my map right here, you'll see that Jenkins is responsible for running all of these different tests. And so configuring him is going to be what makes all the magic happen inside of this. So first thing I need to do is create a Jenkins slave. What a slave is, is when Jenkins gets a request saying, hey, something just happened, I need to do something now, he's going to say, okay, let's, uh, let's make a new instance pop up, and let's have that new instance run all the test cases. That way, if I get a whole bunch of, of, of code coming in all at once, then I can pop up a whole bunch of instances, and they can all do their testing and, and push things in. And so creating an instance for Jenkins to run as slaves is, is the first step of making sure I can do that. And one of the things that you soon learn is that Jenkins requires Java on it to run. Well, CoreOS doesn't come with Java. And so what you need to do is you need to actually hack it or put in the script that I found online that some guy used, which was great, and then you're able to have Java installed on your slaves. So this right here is actually pretty uh, important to getting things done. The other thing you'll need to do is make sure that Jenkins can log into it. So I went to MetaCloud, I created a separate user called Jenkins CI, and he does everything that Jenkins can do. So he doesn't have commit privileges, all he can do is he can take things from GitLab and build it. Okay, so once you have your slave built, now you gotta start configuring Jenkins. First thing you gotta do is start looking through all of these different plugins they have. And that's one of the great things about Jenkins. Even though it's somewhat crusty and old, and not my favorite continuous integration service to work with, it still has so many modules in there that it makes it so I don't have to do any work. And so what I did is I start looking at all the modules and which are the ones that I actually need to do what, what I need to get done. 
So the first one was I needed a GitLab plugin so that I could talk with GitLab. The second one is I needed an OpenStack plugin so that I could talk with OpenStack. So, and this is the one that would work with any OpenStack. Uh, the other one was the CloudBees uh, build and publish plugin. So what this one does is it allows me to build containers and then push them to a registry. And you can tell it wherever you want it to push it. And then I also wanted the Slack plugin because I wanted to show people, or wanted everybody to know what was happening. And then finally I used the SSH plugin, which allows me to just go through and run some simple ones. I used that for the last job, which actually pushes things out into production. So that's step one. Of, the, of setting up Jenkins. Well, I guess step two, we set up the slave. Now we're going to be doing the plugins. Now we're going to go through and manage Jenkins. And there's this long page that has a whole bunch of configuration knobs that you can push. And the more plugins you get, the more knobs you get. So it, it can get pretty tedious. So first is how do you set up OpenStack? Well, it's pretty simple because there's a, there's a form that you fill out. And the most difficult thing for me on this one, uh, well, one was reading the documentation because you've got to finally read the documentation. I don't do that. Um, so I did that finally. And I found that the identity requires that you do lawn known production, which is the project name. So you put the project name, and then you put on your user ID. So my user was Jenkins CI, and the project was lawn known production. And then the endpoint uh, URL, and then the default region, region 1. So that's how I first get it in. And then you can test the connection, and you can make sure that you're actually, it, it'll say a success. I was able to talk with OpenStack. Next, after you have OpenStack configured, you're going to do the slave image. And so that image that you put Java on, you take, you, you take a snapshot of it, and you make it so everything can run. And so then, it, then you, you reference that inside of the field up here um, where it says image. And then you give it the flavor size and all those things that you would want. And from there, every time Jenkins does a job, you can say, hey, run the Jenkins core OS as your slave for this. And multiple projects can use different slaves, so you can configure a lot of different things on it. And lastly, you have this ability to also put in cloud config scripts on the server when it comes up. OK, so that's just the basic configuration of Jenkins. We've already done it. Now let's build a project. And this project is for our Lawn Gnomes productions. So the new project is, uh, this case I call it TCO test. It's just a freestyle project. It means I can add whatever plugins I want to it. So first I want to make sure that the job only runs on slaves instead of running on the main Jenkins server. I don't want that to happen. And then I want it to be able to do a git checkout. So that's the first thing it's going to do. It's going to create a slave, and it's going to check out code. And then you tell it, when do you want it to check out code? Or when do you want it to um, take a look at it? And you say, well, whenever some, or when do you want Jenkins to do something? And it says, whenever a change is pushed to GitLab, make sure that you run it there. Well, maybe you don't want to do that. Maybe you just want to do it two, 10 times a day. So maybe you only build 10 times a day. It depends how complicated your project is. Ours is pretty simple. Um, and then you, you can decide when it's actually going to build. So there's, a, there's some flexibility in there that's pretty nice. And then finally, tell it to use the slave. So I'm giving it the slave ID here, and I'm telling it to use it once. Once I'm done using it, get rid of it. If you're using a cloud like AWS where you're paying, where you pay by the hour, it doesn't really make sense to get rid of it right away. You want to keep that around until your hour is expired. That way, you, um, you don't waste your money. Keep bringing up different instances. And then finally, you put the last step in Jenkins, and you say, OK, build it. What do you want to do build? So in this example right here, I'm just using the get the, the Docker uh, build and push plugin. So I just tell it, hey, just push it here. Give it a tag called the latest. I could give it environment variables if I wanted to ramp up. And then after that, and this right here is where you would add things. Like if you had Ruby, you'd say, OK, uh, I need to do our spec test. So after the container is built, you might put stuff there. You might put custom, uh, uh, custom test codes in there. Whatever it is, is that you have. But this is a step that you would add that. And then finally, what happens after it builds? Well, in this case, what I'm doing after it builds is it's going to update the web servers. And that's a new job. So that's a different Jenkins job that I've configured. And that one's not very uh, interesting, because all it does is do SSH. And I wrote a blog on that, and I'll, I'll put that out on the, um, on the website, on the GitLab, or on, on my GitHub stuff after this presentation as well. 
Okay, so that's pretty basic. I mean, that's, that's it. So what about integrating with GitLab? You have to do some setup on GitLab, and if you're not using GitLab, if you're using GitHub, there's still some setup there. You, it's the same idea. You're just doing webhooks to make sure that it integrates in with it. And so what I did is I'm doing the trigger anytime a uh, push event happens, then I notify uh, Jenkins that something happened. And so he'll then go through and, and do stuff. So it's pretty, pretty easy. It's just like one or, one or two steps that you have to find on your project of where you want that to happen. And lastly, the one I think is super important is integration with Slack or some type of chat system. Um, HipChat is very popular as well. Uh, Spark that we do at Cisco is actually something that I'm hoping will have these fe features and capabilities right coming in the future. It doesn't right now because what I want it to be able to do is do plugins. I want it when GitLab receives a, get a code push, I want people to know that, hey, somebody just pushed code. And I can't do that super easily on um, Cisco Spark today. So I'm using Slack right now in my environment to do that. And it's pretty easy. You just create a webhook, define the channel you want it to be done in, and then you copy the URL. And then in Jenkins, you add that URL, and you add when you want it to be done. OK. And then this is an example of what you see. So I've, I've kind of described it in gory details. I think what's better is you see it live, so you see actually what happens. And so this is actually a real demo. So I'm going to show you how that works. And I think I need to mirror my displays in order to get this to show up. So give me a second. I'll mirror my display, and I'll show you the. Um, Okay. So here's my here's my code right here. This is Lawn Gnomes as a service, and I'll just refresh the page. So somebody put that up, and this is what's happening locally on my desktop right now. So I'm developing everything locally on my machine. So let me sh let me do some code changes, and let's see what happens when I do that. So I'm not sure if somebody on my team put that up for you so you can see it. So let me do a get pull to see if anybody did any changes while I wasn't looking. OK, so it looks like somebody did. It looks like somebody changed the home page and somebody changed the readme. I can see what that looks like on my local machine. Sorry. So somebody said announcing lawn gnomes as a service. That's what they made as their tagline. So maybe that's kind of old. Maybe that's not something we should be showing. Maybe we want to say, have it say something different. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to edit this readme or this home home page, and this is the web page. So he said announcing lawn gnomes as a service. So let's say that you know people already know about that. Or actually, that was my code that I didn't change. It announcing lawn. Gnomes. Okay. So I'm going to say, how about I say something like um, the leading? Because maybe we got competitors that came. Like we just learned about a new competitor that's doing lawn gnomes. Oh my gosh. So we are the leading lawn gnomes as a service provider. So that's the code change that I do. It's very simple. I'm going to do a git commit. And I give it a message. And I'll say, I changed the uh, header page. Now I'm going to push that to GitLab. So it pushed it to GitLab. And I got alert on my phone, because I have Slack running. So it said, hey, somebody made a push. But I also have it running on my desktop here. So you can see here that Jenkins told me, oh, Valor just pushed the code change right here uh, a GitLab. And now Jenkins is going to start building it. So if I go over to Jenkins, let me go pretty quickly here, because I'm probably going to. So let me log into MetaCloud here. So sign me out, because I'm not uh, logged in yet. OK, so if I go to my environment, I, I have access to several different uh, projects. But you're going to see that it, it started kicking off a new instance. So it created this uh, Jenkins CoreOS 74 four minutes ago. And it started building it. Well, maybe that's a job that was already happening. OK, so no, I'm sorry. So that was a previous build. So it's this Jenkins Core OS 73 is the instance that it's going to spawn up to do my tests. I can go into uh, Git, 
lab right here and I can see what just happened. So you can see that I just made that change about a minute ago. And then Jenkins is now building that server on Cisco OpenStack Private Cloud. So if I refresh this page, uh, it's still got the 73 is coming up, I guess. And so when he comes up, he'll start building the instance. And then you'll start seeing it going through the dashboard thing. I thought it was all happening a little too quick there. Um, and then the alerts will come through with, with Slack. Um, if you have any more questions about how we're doing this demo, we're also showing this in uh, number six over there, how we go through and we update this whole process. Granted, there's a few things missing, but for the most part, these are the, the core components of it. So while we wait for it to boot, so app in here, go back to my slides. So this is interesting because it looks like it happened really fast already. Yeah, so the Jenkins went and then it stopped. Oh wait, this is 1238, yeah, 1239. So all this already happened. See, it, it's too fast, you can't even see it. <laughs> and then there's this job that seems to be stuck right here. So I'm not sure what that one is. Anyway, so let me, uh, let me just conclude this and then I'll um, leave some time for questions. But, um, okay. So in summary, what I did is I, I demonstrated how we use the application uh, delivery pipeline to take an application that you're writing, use OpenStack Private Cloud, and then deliver it. It's important to note that this cloud can be used on any stack. I'm just using open source tools here. Um, if I were to go further, I would recommend using something like Project Shift, which can do more of this, and it is actually much more applicable to maybe a real world environment. Um, and different tools can be used and substituted when you want them done. And lastly, um, I want to echo something that I heard in the last presentation is that we're not all artistic snowflakes and our problems aren't actually unique. And so many of the problems that we're trying to solve have already been solved by other people. And so there's a lot of work that's out there already. And I think you can agree with me that what I've showed you is an example of how you do DevOps. But I think you'll also notice that I didn't write any code. So you can do DevOps without any code. I mean, Ansible, that was just configuration scripts, but that's nothing different than if you were to configure an ASR router, right? And so everything is, there's all this stuff that's done. Now there's gonna be these one-off cases where you're gonna need to write code. And so I'm not saying you don't need to write code, but a lot of this can be done just taking components that are already out there and integrating them all together. So there's a couple other cloud breakout sessions I would encourage you to attend. Uh, Chris Jackson and I will be presenting one on DevOps on Thursday. We'll be closing out the breakouts. And um, that's my presentation. And thank you. Unless there's any questions, I'll be here. So. Ballard, thank you very much. We, we do have time for a few questions if we have some from the audience here. I've got the microphone. It's better that you speak into the microphone if that's OK, because the session is being recorded and it will be available again on the DevNet portal at the end of the session. So any questions? 